Now this evening, we're going to come to the end of the age. Long awaited, and from it, we'll speak about it. Now, I'm going to speak about a passage from the Old Testament, and it requires considerable exposition. It's not easy, but if you'll go through with it and be patient and ask the Lord's help to follow me, I believe it will be a blessing to you. The psalm we're going to read is Psalm 110, and I believe there's tremendous truth concerning the close of the age contained in this psalm. Psalm 110, it only has seven verses. We'll read them all through. In due course, I'm going to give you the Prince Version, which is a little different from the King James. The Lord said unto my Lord, Put thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn, and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord of thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the hay. We'll look mainly tonight at the first four verses of that psalm. The first verse of Psalm 110 it's quoted more often in the New Testament than any other passage of the Old Testament. It's quoted in Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, and Hebrews, five times in the New Testament. Obviously, it has something to say to New Testament believers. Jesus quotes it about himself and reveals that he is the one whom David calls my Lord. He said, The Lord said unto my Lord that God the Father said to Christ the Son, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now, the Bible reveals that's where Christ is at this very moment. He is at God's right hand, waiting for the Father to make his enemies his footstool. At God's right hand, he has two special ministries. The two greatest ministries available to any person. Those ministries are the ministry of a priest and the ministry of a king. And they are of great practical importance for us because I will show you this evening out of the Bible that those two ministries are also made available to every believer in Christ. And every believer in Christ is appointed of God to exercise the ministry of a priest and the ministry of a king. Jesus is our pattern, but we are united with him in these two ministries. Now let's look first of all at the ministry of the priest. This is stated in verse 4 of Psalm 110. The Lord hath sworn to Christ, his Son, and will not repent, there is no going back on it. Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Now this is quoted in Hebrew. And we need to turn to Hebrews for a moment to see what the writer of Hebrews said. We turn to the end of chapter 6 in Hebrews and the beginning of chapter 7. The last verse of chapter 6, Hebrews 6.20, speaks about that holiest place of all within the veil in the immediate presence of God that was typified by the holiest of all in the tabernacle constructed by Moses but has its real fulfillment in the actual presence of Almighty God in the temple made without hands in heaven. And the scripture says, there into that place in the immediate presence of God, Christ has entered as our forerunner, the one who goes before us to prepare the way for us that we also may enter in there following after him. This is stated in Hebrews 6:20. Whither, that is, within the second veil, the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made a high priest forever 
after the order of Melchizedek. Then in the next verses, at the beginning of chapter 7, the writer explains what is meant by the order of Melchizedek. Now Melchizedek is a Hebrew name divided into two halves. You're probably where all Hebrew names have a meaning. There is no such thing as a meaningless Hebrew name. Melchi is king, Sedek is righteousness. So Melchizedek means king of righteousness. This is explained here by the writer, beginning at verse 1 of chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest to the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the throat of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first, being by interpretation of his name, king of righteousness, Melchizedek, then also king of Salem, in Genesis 14, when he met Abraham, he is portrayed as the king of Salem. Salem is the same as the modern Hebrew word shalom, and it means peace. So by the meaning of his name, he is king of righteousness. By the place where he ruled, he is king of peace. And then he is also the priest of the Most High God. The priest and the king at God's right hand, Jesus, our forerunner, our personal representative, who is entered in there to prepare the way for us that we may follow him right in where he has gone. All right, that's his position as king and priest. Let us look a little further at the statements about his kingship. And we'll turn to two other crowns. We'll read the opening verses of Psalm 2. This psalm also is quoted several times in the New Testament. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Generally speaking, in the King James, where you read heathen or notion, you should understand Gentile nation. When you read people, it usually refers to Israel. Even today, the Jews call themselves the people. They call all other nations Goyim. How many of you know what the Jews mean by Goyim? It means all other nations except Israel. So, by the word of God and in the terminology of Scripture, the human race is divided into two categories. One very small category, the people, Israel. One very large category, all other nations, the nation or the Gentiles. So, why do the Gentile nations rage and the people of Israel imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth, that's Pontius Pilate and Herod, set themselves, and the rulers of Israel take counsel together against the Lord and against his Christ. This is applied to this situation by the early church in Acts chapter 4. And it's about the only time in history that the rulers of Israel have really ever agreed with the kings of the Gentile nations. Ironically enough, it was in betraying the Messiah. Now these say together, they reject the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. In one of his parables, Jesus expressed this in the phrase, we will not have this man to rule over us. Here we have a deliberate rejection on the claim of Jesus Christ to be God's anointed king and ruler over the human race. In rejecting Christ, they reject also God the Father who sent him. So we have here the rejection of the rulership of Christ portrayed. Now we have in the verses that follow the reaction of God the Father to this rejection and then the response of God the Son to the reaction of God the Father. That sounds a little complicated, but I think you can follow it. Verse 4, He that sitteth in the heaven, that's God the Father, shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. In the sight of God, the rebellion and the wickedness of man is laughable. God laughs at his enemies. In the Bible, laughter is not the reaction to the comical, it's the expression of triumph. Put the bad out in mind. When God makes you laugh in the spirit, you're triumphing over your enemy. And I know nothing that liberates and cleanses more than spirit-given laughter. And remember, it's not something comical. 
It's the expression of supreme triumph. When you can laugh at your enemies, they're contemptible. And that's where every one of us should be in Christ, able to laugh at our enemies. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. And this is what he said. He said, if you can roar and you can rage and you can refuse, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. My king is there. You can do nothing about it. You have no power whatever to change it. He's there at my right hand. He's my anointed king. Now in the response to this, the Trun speaks. This is a dialogue in heaven. Don't you think it's a privilege to have a revelation of what's being said in heaven? Now the Son takes up the word and says, I will declare the decree. The Lord, God the Father, hath said unto me, God the Son, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. Now it's most important that you understand which day is this day. It's a specific day in history. Which day is it? What happened? Resurrection, that's right. This is not referring to eternity. This is referring to the resurrection of Christ from the dead, which is referred to consistently through the scripture as being born or begotten from the dead. So on the day of the resurrection, God declares a decree. He turns to the Son and says, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee from the dead. And then he says, You are my ruler. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the nations for thine inheritance, the animal parts of the earth for thy possession. All right, now turn to Psalm 89. This is what's called a messianic psalm. In other words, though it speaks about David, it does not really refer to David, but to David's greater son, his Lord, Jesus Christ. For instance, it says, in the opening verses of the psalm, verse 3, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have thrown unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. We know now that that is fulfilled in Christ and his throne. Christ, the seed of David, sitting on the throne of David and ruling for all generations. Now turning on to verse 26, and I cannot, you know, go through all the details because it takes several hours, but it all fits into the pattern. We come to the same point in God's dealings that dealt with in Psalm 2, and we have another example of the exchange between Father and Son after the resurrection. Verse 26, He shall cry unto me that the Son shall cry to the Father, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. The rock of his salvation through the resurrection of the dead. By the resurrection of the dead, God begat Jesus again, made him his firstborn from the dead, and declared him to be his chosen king. And Jesus, on the other hand, acknowledged God the Father and the rock of his salvation. So we have this picture, which is out of time, it's in eternity, it's in the heavenly realm of what took place at the time of the resurrection of Christ. Now going on to verse 27, the Father goes on, And I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. Firstborn from what? From the grave, that's right. And because he's the firstborn from the grave, he's also the ruler of the kings of the earth. The two things go together. Now, turn for a moment to Colossians 1. I realize this is complicated, and some of you are saying, how will I ever remember all these scriptures? But you'll get the message, and then you can do some homework on the scripture. Colossians 1, 17 and 18. This is speaking about Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 16, 17 and 18, set forth Jesus twice the first the first before all creation, and the first of the new creation 
through being begotten from the dead. Jesus has the preeminence in both creation. He was the author of creation the first time, and he was the first begotten of the dead, the head of the new order, the second time, so that all things he has the preeminence. Verse 17, we'll not look at verse 16, because that goes back into eternity. We don't have time this evening. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Everything is held in being by him, Jesus Christ. And he is the head of the body, the church. The church is his body, who is the beginning, the beginning of the new order, the new creation, the firstborn from the dead. Notice what he is. He is the head of the body and the firstborn from the dead. Now this is apply or taken from the pattern of natural birth. In an ordinary natural birth, what part of the body emerges first? The head. Well, when the head comes, it's the guarantee the body is going to follow. So Jesus was the firstborn of the dead, the head emerging from the womb of the grave, the guarantee that his body will follow him in resurrection. He's the firstborn from the dead, the head of the body. Reading Revelation 1, verses 4 and 5. John to the seven churches who are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. That's God the Father. From the seven spirits which are before his throne, that's the Holy Spirit in sevenfold aspect. And if you want to know the sevenfold aspect of the Holy Spirit, they're found in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. All right, we don't have time to go there now, but those are the sevenfold aspects of the Holy Spirit. The seven spirits which are yet one spirit. If you want a pattern from the natural order, it's the rainbow, which is one rainbow split up into seven colors. That's nature's carnival of the Holy Spirit. All right, the seven spirits which are before the throne. The third is from Jesus Christ. Now notice, there are three statements about Jesus Christ. He is the faithful witness while he was on earth. He witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. He never swerved from the truth. He always declared the truth and he always declared who he was, though it cost him his life. Secondly, he is the firstborn of the dead. Because he was the faithful witness, God begat him again from the dead, justifying his son and overthrowing the decision of two courts that had condemned him to death, the religious court of the Jews the secular court of the Romans. By the resurrection, God revoked those two unjust decisions and vindicated the righteousness of his Son and declared him to be indeed the Son of God. Romans 1, 4 declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. So he's the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the prince or ruler of the kings of the earth. Now that is to see who Jesus is. And you want to get these three things in the right order. He's the faithful witness in his earthly life, the firstborn of the dead in his resurrection, and because of that, he is now, right now, the ruler of the kings of the earth. That's not going to happen. It has happened. In Revelation, the 19th chapter, he's called Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Now, that's not just fancy language. That has a real meaning. In my book, I explain it this way. He is the ruler over ruling and the governor over government. All rulers and all governments have one supreme governor. Very, very important to see this. It's all related to our theme of what we do about the government. Every earthly government is answerable to one supreme government. And his name is Jesus. All right, now, just to put a little icing on the cake, we look at one other Old Testament scripture which portrays Jesus in his double ministry of king and priest. It's in a little book called Zechariah. Now, when you read the minor prophets, bear in mind they're minor in length, not in content. They're just as important as any other part of the Word of God. Zechariah, the sixth chapter, verses 12 and 13. Zechariah 6, 12. Now, part of the message of Zechariah is contained in type. In other words, things which are natural but are pictures of things which are spiritual. 
In the fourth chapter of Zechariah, we have Zerubbabel, who was the governor of Judah at that time, but Zerubbabel is a type of Jesus Christ, the builder of the temple. In the fifth chapter of Zechariah, we have Joshua, the son of Josedek, who was the high priest in the day of Zechariah. But he is a type of Jesus Christ, God's eternal high priest. So what is said about Joshua and Zerubbabel is not so much important about them, it's important when we apply it to Jesus Christ. This is the principle of type and antitype. Like the Passover lamb is the type, Jesus, the Lamb of God, is the antitype. Zerubbabel, the builder of the temple, is the type. Jesus, the builder of the temple of the Lord, is the antitype. Uh, Joshua, the high priest, is the type. Jesus, the eternal high priest, is the antitype. This is a principle that goes all through Scripture, see. And it's applied by the writers of the New Testament many times over. It has complete foundation in Scripture. So now we're going to talk about Joshua as the type of Jesus, the high priest. Verse 12, speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man. Who else said that? Pontius Pilate, didn't he? Of who? Jesus. Behold the man. That, that's the subject for a sermon in itself. The only man who ever was what every man should have been. Behold the man. Jesus Christ. Now, we are told seven things about him. You remember the seven statements in Daniel? Here we have seven similar statements. Behold the man. Let me stop for a moment and remind you that Jesus is still a man. Can you agree? All right, now he is God. He always was God. He always will be God. But when through incarnation he became man, he didn't become man just for 33 and a half years. He became man forever. A new order came into being. The God-man race, Emmanuel, God with us. And that's the new race that God is interested in. Just to give you two scriptures so that you don't call me a heretic, First Corinthians 15, 47, the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. First Timothy 2, 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. That was written long after the resurrection. Jesus is the mediator, the man at God's right hand. It really is overwhelming. I mean, it's impossible to take it in that there's a representative of the human race at the right hand of Almighty God, at the seat of all authority and power in the entire universe. That's something to meditate on. All right, now then, are you with me? Behold the man, we're in Zechariah 6, 12, whose name is the branch. That's one of the titles of Messiah. Infused in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, and in Zechariah. He's the branch, he's the rod out of the stem of Jesse, the root and the offspring of David. It's used of him in the New Testament. So he's the branch. Number two, he shall grow up out of his place. And this has got a lesson for all of us. There's only one place you can grow spiritually, and that's your place. You have to find your place, and then you can grow. A person out of his place, the Bible says, as a bird that wandereth from her neck, so is a man out of his place. Have you ever seen anything more pathetic and helpless than a bird that's wandered from its nest? And a believer out of his place is just like that. If you want to grow, you've got to grow out of your place. It points out also the humility of Jesus. He didn't start at the top and work down like some of us would like to do. He started at the bottom and grew up. Isaiah 53 says, He shall grow like a root out of a dry ground. That's a tremendous lesson. If you want spiritual progress, Find your place. He shall grow up out of his place. That's the second statement. The third statement is, he shall build the temple of the Lord. And that's so important it's repeated. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. What is the temple of the Lord? The body of Christ or the church. That's right. And that is so important that it's stated twice. 
who's the builder of the church? Jesus Christ. Whose church is it? Yeah, I hope it is, don't you? I heard Kenneth Hagin say once that he'd been teaching on the gifts of the Holy Spirit and at the end the lady came up to him and said, Brother Hagin, uh, we don't have those gifts in our church. And he answered, well, sister, they have them in the church of Jesus Christ, which is yours. And that's a pretty far-reaching question, which is yours. Jesus said in Matthew 16, I will build my church. The only church that belongs to him is the one that he's building. If you don't allow him to build it, it isn't his. He is the builder of the church. All right, the next statement, he shall bear the glory. In Hebrew, the word glory is directly related to the word for weight. Paul prays on this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where he talks about a far more eternal and exceeding weight of glory. And glory is a weight. Do you think you could bear the glory? Brother, you'd crumple under it. There's only one man who can bear the glory, and that's Jesus. And he bears it all. Hallelujah. But he shares it with us. You remember he prayed for his disciples that they might be with him with the glory that he had with the Father before the foundation of the world. He is now bearing the glory. He's glorified at the Father's right hand. He shall bear the glory and the next statement, he shall sit and rule upon his throne. What kind of a person rules on a throne? The king, that's right. So he's the king at God's right hand, and the next statement, he shall be a priest upon his throne. You see the revelation? The king, priest, or the priest, king, ruling and ministering as a priest. And the last statement, which is fantastic, is the council of peace shall be between them both. And where it says both, the Hebrew uses the word two, the two of them. Now that is pretty deep theology. Who are the two? The Father and the Son. So there is plurality in the Godhead. Never get away from that. The council of peace shall be between the two of them. And in John 17, which is very closely related to this passage, we won't turn there, Jesus prayed that all believers might be one even as the Father and he are one. How are the Father and he one? Through what? The Holy Spirit. That's right. I heard Kenan Ryan say this. I don't think he meant it as a conclusive definition because it's inadequate, but as an illuminating statement, it's very helpful. The Holy Spirit is the love relationship between the Father and the Son. So, by the Holy Spirit, all we believers in Christ can be just as much one as the Father and Son are one. And through the Holy Spirit, the counsel of peace can be between them and us. We can think the thoughts of God, will the will of God, and declare the purpose of God just as surely as Christ the Son did. Do you want to go over those statements? All right. Think of all, he's the man. Then we have, I think, seven statements. His name is the branch. He's the Messiah, the root of the stem of David. He grows up out of his place, a root out of a dry ground. Isaiah 53, hath no form nor comes in it. When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He grows out out of his place, out of the dry ground. He's the builder of the temple of the Lord, the church. He's the only one who bears the glory. He rules as a king upon his throne. He's also a priest at God's right hand. And the council of peace is between the Father and the Son on the throne. Now, I believe by the grace of God, by the Holy Spirit, and by the Word of God, we have been granted a revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and make it over unto you. And out of the Word of God tonight, the Holy Spirit has made over to us the truth about Jesus Christ. And if there's any truth we need to know, it's this. 
in the state of chaos and disorder and rebellion and lawlessness on earth. We need to know who Jesus is and where he is. He's true and priest and brother of the temple of the Lord. He's bearing the glory. He's at the Father's right hand. He's ruling over in the midst of his enemies. And the council of peace is between Father and Son. Now when you really get that into your spirit, you can sit back and relax. There isn't anything to worry about. God is in control. Jesus is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. See, if we go around worried and perplexed and fearful, it's because we haven't received the revelation which the Holy Spirit offers us through the Scripture revealing Jesus. Once you really know about Jesus, you don't worry. One thing about the early church is very obvious. They were a tiny, despicable little minority in the midst of an alien, hostile, cruel, despotic world. And they were never frightened of the world. The world was scared of them. Right from the beginning, the world was afraid of the church. That's how we have to be at the close of the age. All right, no, no, we've dealt with Jesus at the Father's right hand, King and Priest. Now let's see that you and I are there with him. This is the next revelation. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We'll go back to Revelation 1. First of all, Revelation 1, we read verse 4. Now we'll read verse 5. Revelation 1, 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us king and priest unto God, and his thunder. So everyone who has been washed in the blood of Jesus has been made, not is going to be made, but has been made a king and a priest to God the Father. Or more literally, a kingdom and priest. Or a kingdom of priests. The only people in this kingdom are priests. No one else has any right in this kingdom but priests. It's a kingdom of priests. Just to illustrate this, let me take a couple of phrases. If I talk about a race of giants, the only people in that race are giants. Nobody else belongs. Or if I talk about a society of botanists, then the only people in that society are botanists. So a kingdom of priests, the only people in that kingdom are priests. To be in the kingdom, you have to be a priest. But through the blood of Jesus, we have been made both kings and priests under God the Father. That's tremendously under God the Father when you think about it. Revelation 5, 9 and 10 contains the same truth again. Revelation 5, 9 and 10. We, while going into the background, we just get the principle. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us kings and priests unto our God. Notice again, it's not in the future. The moment you have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, you have been made a king and a priest. It's redemption by blood that makes you both king and priest. Never in the New Testament is it placed in the future. Always in the past. It's not something that's going to happen. It's something that has happened. Some people don't recognize themselves. I was preaching this in Amarillo and Brother Shelby was telling us the next day that he was in the restaurant getting a meal and he asked when he was to pay his bill and the waitress said, you pay to the man behind the desk there. He's the manager. He doesn't look like the manager, but he is the manager. So Shelby said to the waitress, well, that's remarkable because people don't always look like what they are. He said, I'm a king. I might not look like it, but I'm a king. The waitress said, you are? Don't worry about it. And we said, and I'm a priest, too. And she said, oh? 
<laughs> that I may not look like it, but I am. So bear that in mind if you go wrong now, you may not look like it, but you are.